I invite the man, Minister of Mental Health and Addiction to the house in prayer or reflection. With thanks to my friends Terry and Maria, I offer the chamber a poem from the late great poet Lee Maracle, who just passed last week. It's titled Language. Do you speak your language? I stare. I just said, how are you? I thought English was my language. Apparently it isn't. I thought halkaminim was gibberish, the devil's language. That's what the nun said. 
Apparently not. Some white guy sets me straight. Aboriginal people are losing languages. Funny, I thought I had it just a moment ago. Maybe it's in grandma's old shoebox. Maybe it's sandwiched between papers, in plastic bags hidden under my mum's bed. Hey, has anyone seen my language? Will my words dangle from empty, raped mountains, laid waste on dead seas? Or will they sing sweet from the skirt of winds remembered songs of hope not realized? I weave this imagined dream world onto old Squamish blankets, history hole punched and worn, to recraft today, to remember future in this new language. And I sing, I am home again. Introduction by members, a member for Columbia River Revelstoke. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It gives me a great deal of pleasure this morning to introduce an amazing person who is in the gallery today, and that is Deb Fisher. <clears throat> Deb's life has been dedicated to kids and her Métis community. Her passion for both does not come from choice, but it is ingrained in her DNA. She has worked for the school district, helping Indigenous and non-Indigenous kids navigate the many paths and challenges <clears throat> and she's been the director of education for the Shushwap Indian Band. <clears throat> she's been a huge supporter of our Summit Youth Center, and she's always very honest and never bashful in sharing her ideas with me. She is the, has been the president of the Columbia Valley Métis Association and is now the elected regional four director for the Métis Nation of British Columbia. And above all, Bev's my friend. Mr. Speaker, if love had a twin sister, it would be Deb Fisher. I'd ask all members in this house to please give Deb a very warm welcome to this very special place. Minister of Children and Family Development. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. I rise today in this house to introduce Paige Sutton, who, as a member of the Lindenwood University Women's Lacrosse Team, won the 2021 NCAA Division II National Championship. She's joining us virtually from her college dorm in St. Charles, Missouri. Paige was also a recipient of the 2021 NCAA Elite 90 Award. Founded by the NCAA, the Elite 90 Award is given to a student athlete who achieves the highest academic standard among their peers while competing and winning a national championship. Paige is also a GLVC Brother James Gaffney Distinguished Scholar academic All-GLVC honoree and was selected to the All-GLVC team and finished in the top three in scoring. Congratulations to you, Paige. We are honoured to have you from our community and we are delighted to see where your academic and sporting excellence will take you. Will all members of this house please join me in celebrating her today. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And following on from my colleague, the member for Columbia River Revelstoke, I, I stand today to uh, ask the House to honour and welcome members of the Métis Nation BC, as well as a Métis elder, who are joining us here in the gallery today. They joined me earlier in the, uh, in the Hall of Honour in a ceremony and proclamation presentation in recognition of Louis Rielde. Métis Nation BC delegation, I'd like to introduce them. Uh, Louis de Jager, who is the acting VP for MNBC, Daniel Fontaine, who is the CEO, Chris Gall, the Chief Public Affairs Officer, Patrick Harriet, uh, MNBC Director, Region 1, Kate Elliott, the Women's Chair, Deborah Fisher, Minister of Education and Children and Families, Mark Carlson, who is the Chair of the Metis Assembly of Natural Resources, Jeremy Twig, Associate Director, Intergovernmental Affairs, and Barbara Hume, the elder and ex officio member of the Métis Nation of Greater Victoria. Would the House please welcome these members? Member for Chilliwack Kent. 
Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I would like to follow the Minister in welcoming um, my constituent and a friend, Louis de Jagger. Um, he's up in the gallery, and I, I am so grateful and honoured to be able to introduce them. Um, they're the Acting Vice President of Métis Nation BC, as was mentioned, and the Minister of Economic Development and Natural Resources. And in Chilliwack, Kent, there's so much more than that as well, and we're so grateful to have him as part of our community um, and in this leadership role. So welcome. Would the House please help me? Member for Boundaries Milkamine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's my distinct privilege today to welcome to the gallery uh, Miles Semenoff. Uh, and no offense, Miles, but more importantly, your mother, who is here with you today. Uh, um, and uh, uh, enormous gratitude. So Jennifer Wetmore is one of the people that came forward in the, the boundary floods in 2018 uh, to really champion small economic uh, uh, business development and help us navigate that, that process in an incredibly challenging time for her community, our community. And so, uh, again, distinct privilege to welcome the two of them here today. Minister of Citizens Services. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. I have two very special guests in the gallery today who are coming to watch Question Period for the first time. They happen to be the parents of a friend to this house, as well as a dear friend of myself and the member of Maple Ridge Mission, and the Chair of School District 42, Corleen Carreras. So will the House please join me in welcoming Alan and Lena Barkley to the House today. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Introduction of bills. Member for City South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ah, I'm having the same problem. I move that uh, the bill entitled the Building Amendment Act, of which notice has been given on my, in my name on the order paper, be introduced and read a first time now. Nearly 25% of BC's population identifies as having a disability, and the population of people with disabilities is growing at nearly twice the rate of the non-disabled population. The problem is we aren't planning for it. The legislation that I'm introducing today for a fourth time would require that all new multi-unit housing built would consider accessibility, and that a percentage of all new housing would be required to meet the criteria of either adaptable, visitable, or accessible. The American Housing Survey in 2011 found that less than 1% of housing is accessible for wheelchair users. While I haven't seen similar research in Canada, I would argue we would find similar results. Of the thousands being built in my constituency alone, nothing is accessible, and except for the odd condo development where nothing is even remotely adaptable. And right now, we are not building housing that works for everyone, Mr. Speaker. We need homes that are truly accessible or adaptable, where it is considered at every step of the process from the very foundation. We've just recently unanimously passed accessibility legislation in this House. The issue yet has not to be contemplated, though. Government has launched a consultation on accessibility issues and the building code just last week. While standards are readily available, we have made the use of them or building to them optional, and we must course correct. We need to ensure an accessibility lens is applied when considering building for the future in all housing types, social, rental, single family, condos, and townhomes. It's time to make a change to mandate the development of housing that works for everyone. Members, the question is the first reading of the bill. All those in favor indicate aye. aye. Those who oppose, motion carried. Mr. Speaker. Continue. Yeah. I move that this bill be placed on the yeah. orders of the day for second reading at the next sitting of the House after today. Members, you heard the motion. All those in favor indicate aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Statements by members. Member for Caribou Chilcotin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When you look up the word cowboy, you will see Willie Christina's picture beside the word. Every time I run across this fellow, he is surrounded by friends and family and very often admirers. You might see him at an auction or a rodeo with rodeo royalty surrounding him. A rancher, a cowboy, a rodeo clown, and of course a longtime rodeo announcer. He is also the owner of what once was the beloved shop known as Willie's Western Wear. He has been attending the Williams Lake Stampede, Mr. Speaker, for longer than I've been alive. 
and for 44 years he has organized a bus trip to the Canadian National Finals Rodeo in Edmonton that is always sold out. There is no question that Willie has been immersed in our Western culture for his entire life, and recently the mark he made on the sport that was forever written into the history books when Willie was inducted into the Cowboy Hall of Fame in 2019. And to add to all of this, he is for certain one of the most beloved 97-year-old characters and community members that we have in the Caribou Chilcotin. Mr. Speaker, he is still active and just returned from his 44th annual NFR trip. It was my absolute honour to present a certificate to Willie at his 97th birthday a few months back and thank him for the work he does, both for rodeo and for our community. He is without a doubt a Caribou Chilcotin icon and a man I am proud to count as a friend. For everyone in the Caribou Chilcotin, and of course all of us here at the BC Legislature, thank you, Willie Christina, for all you have done for our community, for Western culture, and of course for the sport of rodeo. Member for Boundary Smilkamine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I believe I may speak on behalf of the House when I say that our thoughts are with all those in BC that are suffering because of floods and landslides around the province. To all of you who have lost your homes, to all of you who are dealing with evacuation trauma and those separated from loved ones, including those re-evacuated for a second time now this year, please know that our hearts are with you. I know that this chamber, in a fundamental and deeply nonpartisan way, is full of compassion flowing out to you and an eagerness to support you. I rise today to shine some light on the role of local champions in our communities, those souls that go so far beyond their call of duty to help keep their communities safe and to be sure that their communities are restored and thrive in the wake of crises like this. In the context of today, individuals such as Mayor Spencer Coyne stand out. He spent Sunday donning his high-vis vest and light baton to direct traffic for his community. He then worked through the night with the Princeton team to help navigate the breached dike and catastrophic flooding Princeton has seen over the last 48 hours. He happens to be the mayor, but his dedication is rooted in something more foundational, a much deeper passion for place that inspires advocates like himself to lean in for our communities. Even if the passion of rural BC oftentimes blurs the lines of what our roles are supposed to be, this passion for place and people is part of the glue that holds our communities together. This is just one story. There are many more, like paramedic and rural director Tim Roberts, Ma Mayor uh, Manfred Bauer in Karameas, or local journalist Andrea Demir interviewing while waiting for evacuation, or Michael Young, a volunteer helping evacuate the community of Eastgate. I would, of course, be remiss to not give credit to the team of boundary, lead boundary leaders uh, in my community that stepped forward three years ago, a diverse team built on trust, including uh, the member in the gallery here today, or the, my guest in the gallery today. Those stories will have to wait. At the end of the day, as the dust settles after these crises, it's the passion for our people in place that helps make BC resilient and robust. Paid or unpaid, elected, hired, or volunteered, these are the people that provide the glue that makes BC such a wonderful place to be. Thank you. Member for West Vancouver, see to Sky. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on April 2nd, it was BC Ecological Reserve Day. And what is that, I hear you say? Well, and in fairness, that's a pretty good question to all here but a few. In May of this year, it's been 50 years that BC has been working to preserve the province's representative and special natural ecosystem, plant and animal species, features and phenomenon. This is quite a task in a province as diverse as British Columbia. A shout out has to go to Dr. Vladimir Kraina, born in Austro-Hungary in 1905, a professor of botany, a Czech resistance fighter who after being sentenced to death not just by the Nazis but also by the communists, escaped to Canada and made his way to the forestry, a faculty of forestry at UBC. It was during the seemingly boundless 1950s that he saw the tremendous value of our natural ecological gene pool and he advocated that we maintain a small percentage of the land base as a quote, nature museum site, unquote, distinct from parks and as much as possible with human activities limited to research. 
It was this forward thinking in the 1950s that convinced the government of W.A.C. Bennett to ask this legislature to approve the Ecological Reserve Act, which it did, nemine contra descende, on May 4, 1971, which was a first for Canada and with the establishment of 29 reserves. Today there are 148, and while the province when as far as issuing a, pre a brief press release on the anniversary, the BC Parks Elders Council and Friends of Ecological Reserves believe much more needs to be done. Firstly, it's important that we work to complete the system that maintains our precious ecological gene pool res resource. Second is the need for a system plan that, that provides better organizational structure to monitor and maintain and use these reserves appropriately. And finally, the volunteer warden positions are critical. As of April, more than half of these were positions were vacant across the province. I'm sure you'll all join me in appreciating the value of the Ecological Reserves Act and the opportunities it maintains for this province. Let's commit, commit to acting on and reporting out on each of these recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Burnaby North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. November is National Adoption Awareness Month, so today I'd like to honour my parents. I wasn't even old enough to go to school when they sat me down to tell me my story. I remember them describing how they went to the local orphanage to adopt a baby. It was during the post-war baby boom, so they had lots to choose from. They described how they decided it would be me, the girl baby, they would bring home with them. Imagine my surprise later in life when I discovered that my parents were fairly unique in the belief that girl, girls were just as good as boys. But it was their unwavering conviction that I could grow up to be anything I wanted to be that set me on a path that led me here today, speaking to you from my seat in the BC Legislature. I wish they were still alive to witness the success of their parenting skills. Mr. Speaker, adoption is sometimes called a soft stigma. It comes from the notion that adopted children are unwanted children. But I was always secure in the knowledge that I was wanted and cherished. Both my parents came from large extended families and never in my life have I felt less than fully accepted and loved by them. In fact, I know most of my cousins have long forgotten that I'm the adopted one. It certainly isn't documented on the family tree, and my son, my stepson that is, is also recorded there, and his wife is identified by her Chinese name. So, whether you were raised by birth parents, adoptive parents, step-parents, same-sex parents, foster parents, or any other kind of parent, here's to the families that armor us with the protection of their love and wisdom and send us out to make our way in the world. This statement has been authorized by my grandchildren. Thank you. Member for Abbotsford South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As a healthcare professional, my admiration, as always, goes to those who pour their heart and soul into their careers in healthcare. Their job is one of personal sacrifice and dedication every day, but is increasingly so during the challenging times during a world pandemic. My attention lately, however, has been drawn to those who work in the field of respiratory therapy. Respiratory therapists are an essential role in emergency and critical care medicine, and their profession is under extreme staffing strain for several reasons. RTs in BC play a vital role in the diagnosis and treatment of cardiopulmonary illnesses. They work with physicians when advanced airway management is required, and they often stay in the room with patients for hours, managing patients on life support. During the COVID-19 pandemic, RTs have held iPads and cell phones for patients while family members, unable to attend due to restrictions, say goodbye to the loved ones as they turn off the life support. 
They have taken a frontline role in coaching and teaching other staff appropriate PPE measures. They support their nursing colleagues when they're overwhelmed with patient care, and most importantly, have shown up daily when the risk for unknown protective equipment was scarce, all the while fearing that they could go home and infect their loved ones. Currently staffing this profession looks very grim, Mr. Speaker. Projections show that BC will need over 700 RTs by 2025. However, BC only has one university that offers the training required, and that program only produces 90 grads a year. Beyond that, salaries are higher for RTs in Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, even though here in BC we have a significantly higher cost of living. RTs are leaving their profession during a time when they are of utmost importance for roles with higher pay or for provinces with more incentives or a lower cost of living. So today, I would like to not only profess my respect and high regard for respiratory therapists across our province, but would like to call on our government to look into more funding and more training options for this vital profession. They need us and we need them. British Columbians deserve better. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Langley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. SkyTrain is coming to Langley, and it is going to be a significant benefit for British Columbians, taking 17,000 cars off the road and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But it is also going to be a significant benefit for the city of Langley, and that is because of the hard work and heavy lifting that Langley City Council has done in preparing its new official community plan. And this plan, Mr. Speaker, is going to be transformative. And it's going to ensure that with the advent of SkyTrain and the arrival of the SkyTrain stations around 196 and 203rd Street, that we're shaping growth and not just chasing and reacting to it, and that we preserve the community uh, and the community spirit of Langley, while at the same time providing multiple different forms of affordable and diverse housing types. So Langley doesn't just become a city of luxury condos, but a city of affordable multifamily housing where generations, uh, uh, where you can raise generations of family uh, living side by side. And it also takes into account climate change mitigation and ensuring that flood construction levels around the Nickel stay at an appropriate level, which I think, you know, as we've seen in the past, uh, the past few days, is incredibly important. So I just want to take a sec and give a shout out to Langley City Council for all their hard work. Mayor Val Vandenbroek, Councillors Gail Martin, Terry James, Paul Albrecht, Rudy Stortebroom, Rosemary Wallace, and last but not least, my friend uh, Councillor Nathan Pahal. But I also want to take a sec and thank the hard-working staff at Langley City, in particular, all the staff, but in particular, Chief Administrative Officer Francis Chung and Director of Development Services Carl Johansson, who have done a tremendous amount of work on the new official community plan. That, and this plan is going to allow Langley to capitalize on SkyTrain um, and really bring Langley into the 21st century. So will the House please give a big hand for Langley City Council. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to draw the House's attention to an important event in our calendar. Today, November the 16th, is Louis Riel Day. A day to honour an influential leader of the Métis people, as well as an important figure in our shared Canadian history. Louis Riel stood up for Métis rights. He stood up for Métis culture. He was a political leader who fought for human rights. He was a staunch supporter of a multicultural society that honours and values different religions, different points of view and bilingualism. I am pleased that the province of British Columbia today has proclaimed Louis Riel Day. Early this morning, I was honoured to meet with representatives of various Métis organizations in British Columbia. We gathered to witness the Métis flag being displayed in the Hall of Honour. The reason for the early start today is historic. At sunrise on November the 16th, 1885, Louis Riel was hanged at the RCMP barracks in Regina for high treason after the Northwest Rebellion, which he led to protect Métis rights, Métis land, and Métis culture. The Métis people and many others saw him then and still see him as a person who suffered a grave injustice. 
And that is why each year we honour his memory. Today, as well as honouring Louis Riel, we are honouring Métis people who are integral to the rich cultural fabric of our province. So let's take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to recognize the 90,000 Métis people who call this province home and to thank them for their contributions to our province. Official Opposition House Leader. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker, for the opportunity to rise today and respond to the ministerial statement from the, the Minister recognizing Louis Riel Day. And it certainly is an important day for the Métis Nation across Canada and, as we've heard, the nearly 90,000 Métis people right here in British Columbia. It's an effort that involves recognizing the contributions of leaders like Louis Riel, the founder of Manitoba, who played such a critical role in shaping our country and whose advocacy for the Métis Nation must be acknowledged. There was a time when many historians dismissed Louis Riel as a rebel and a traitor, but over time that viewpoint has shifted as Louis Riel is seen to be a charismatic leader who was intent on protecting his people. As we've heard, he had uh, quite a history and it was, uh, um, it's interesting to note that uh, Louis Riel was only 41 when he was hung, so he accomplished a lot in a very short time frame within his political involvement and championship of the Métis lifestyle. His life and the actions he took have certainly been the focus of much study and reflection over the years. But Métis Nation BC notes that after Riel's execution, Métis people across Canada were mass labelled as traitors themselves. And that has led to many feeling the need to hide their Métis culture and identity, which was deeply painful. So I think it's critical that institutions like ours do recognize this significant day to help increase the recognition of Métis people and their many contributions to our province and to Canada. And to celebrate the Métis culture for which too long was hidden away and suppressed. In closing, Mr. Speaker, I also want to acknowledge the new letter of intent between the Métis Nation BC and the province of BC which pursues a new reconciliation agreement and envisions a more collaborative approach to various initiatives. I think we can all agree that these are worthy goals and I look forward to seeing them progress for the benefit of all Métis people in British Columbia. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Member for Sandwich North and Islands. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would like to uh, first uh, start by acknowledging the Métis leaders and elders that are with us uh, in the chamber or in the um, gallery today. Uh, viewing the proceedings uh, here, uh, as well uh, raise my hands in acknowledging that today is uh, proclaimed Louis Riel Day, and to all the Métis Nation and the 90,000 Métis people uh, living in British Columbia today, I stand in recognition of Louis Riel Day. November 16, 1885, Louis Riel was hung for treason and for his role in leading the Northwest Resistance in the Red River Rebellion. Louis Riel is a complex and important figure in Canadian history. He was a political and cultural leader of both the Métis people and a founder of Manitoba. He resisted the Hudson's Bay Company's uh, corporate sale of lands to the Dominion of Canada and stood in defiance of a Crown government that was imposing and encroaching on Indigenous people and their territories. For decades, Riel was treated by Canada and historians as a traitor, and as a result, uh, this unfortunately reflected on all Métis people, as uh, my colleagues have, have previously stated, stigmatizing them as uh, traitors and rebels. We now see Riel for what he is, someone who stood up against a government acting unlawfully. Standing in recognition of days such as this keeps the sacrifices of leaders such as Riel in the front and center of our minds and forces the governments of Canada and British Columbia to come to terms with the history of European settlement of these lands and territories. It is important that Canadians and British Columbians know and understand our history. Today is an important learning opportunity for us all. And in fact, today allowed uh, this preparation for this statement, allowed me to reflect on our history and come to a deeper understanding of those pivotal moments in our history that led us here today. It's important that we do not view this as an annual exercise, a performance of government officials going through 
the motions of acknowledging the past with little or no intention to do much about it. Rhetorical speeches don't replace meaningful action. Even as we stand here today and say these words of remembrance, commemoration and recognition, the struggle of Indigenous peoples continue every day in British Columbia, in the North, the South, the East and the West. The conflict over land that was at the heart of Louis Riel's defiance is ongoing in this country and in this province. Even though politicians in this place easily throw around words to appease and confuse the public, words like title holders, rights holders, and sovereignty, those words have real meaning, Mr. Speaker, and they should not be used if those who utter them have no real intention of breathing life into them. Louis Riel Day marks a tragic day in the history of our country, when a person's life was extinguished for standing in defiance of a government acting unlawfully. Let's never forget the courage, sacrifice, and leadership of Louis Riel. And let us, in this place, ensure that we do everything we can to reconcile the conflict over land and stand in defiance when the acts of this institution ignores the commitments that we have made to all Indigenous people in British Columbia. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Oral questions by members? Official Opposition's Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's been almost two years since the doors of this legislature were swarmed by protesters. Now tensions at the coastal gas link construction site in northern BC are heating up again. More than 500 workers, including Wet'suwet'en members, have been cut off from supplies and the outside world as a result of an illegal blockade. We wrote to the minister about this deteriorating situation nearly three weeks ago. And yesterday, the minister seemed to throw in the towel on ending the blockade by saying, and I quote, unfortunately, despite our government's best efforts, these initiatives have not been successful. End quote. That's simply not acceptable. We're now on day 53 of the blockade. Day 53. What is the minister specifically going to do to ensure that the safety and well-being of workers, more than 500 of them, who are currently trapped behind an illegal blockade? Minister. Thank <coughs> Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. Uh, obviously, uh, an illegal blockade uh, is not acceptable, uh, and we are working very closely in terms of uh, dealing with CGL and the situation for those workers behind those blockade lines, at the same time being in regular contact with the, the RCMP uh, in terms of ensuring that as much as possible we can get this situation resolved and de-escalated in a way that uh, reduces the potential uh, for conflict, which I don't think anybody wants to see. Leader of the Official Opposition, Supplemental. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, no one wants to see a conflict, but what we want to make sure of is that more than 500 people who are trapped behind an illegal blockade are actually cared for. Let's be clear. This is a political standoff, and there are more than 500 workers caught in the crosshairs. There is no way to get supplies in and no way for workers to leave. Supplies will run out in the next several days. And if there is a medical emergency, the illegal blockade puts health and safety of more than 500 workers at risk. These are public roads that are being blocked. There is significant concern about the safety and well-being of more than 500 workers trapped behind an illegal blockade. The company, as the minister well knows, has approvals from the province and support from all 20 elected councils along the route. And he also knows that there is an enforceable BC Supreme Court injunction in place which allows work to continue. So today, as we sit here, there are more than 500 workers trapped. There is a risk of not being able to get supplies in, and if there is a medical emergency, help will not be there. So to the minister, exactly what is his plan 
to deal with the necessity of providing goods and medical uh, provisions for the workers that are trapped behind the blockade. Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And obviously, we are very concerned about the situation at the, uh, the camp. Uh, we have been in contact uh, with uh, CGL. We have been in contact with the RCMP. Uh, we are aware of the situation in terms of supplies and in terms of how we are able to get or supplies can be gotten into uh, the camp uh, as required. Uh, I can tell the, uh, the member in terms of uh, me uh, uh, medical requirements, there is significant medical capacity in that camp at the, at the present time. Uh, but that you, uh, I, I, I was asked a serious question. I'm giving a serious response. And if you want to chuckle and laugh, uh, I, think that's, I don't think that's appropriate. What I'm telling the, uh, the member who asked the question is we are aware of the situation at the camp. We have been in contact with CGL. Um, we know that there are medical capabilities in that camp. And we will ensuring that if medical assistance is required, that it gets in. Uh, we know that the, uh, the, the, uh, the road is blocked. But there are other, for example, by air that can be used. What we want to see in place is a de-escalation. We have been doing efforts over that over the last number of months to be able to do just that. It is a challenging situation. But I also know that that is the, uh, the best way at this point to resolve it. Uh, and that's what we're working to do. Member for Nechako Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 53 days of this blockade, but this has been building over a lot longer. And here's the challenge. The NDP government seems to have different messages for protesters in different regions of the province. In southern BC, the government has supported the elected chiefs who seek employment through forestry. The Premier has consistently urged protesters at Ferry Creek to go home. In the north, the Premier has not supported the elected chiefs and councils. In fact, two cabinet ministers and a former minister have worked hard to ensure that protesters are welcome and supported. So can the Minister of Indigenous Relations explain why the wishes of the elected chiefs in northern BC are dismissed by the province? Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. I think it is unfair to characterize our position in that way. We, I have met uh, on several occasions with elected leaders of the Wet'suwet'en Nation, but of course we're also dealing with those people, the hereditary chiefs, who brought the Delgamuk the Stayway case to the Supreme Court of Canada almost a generation ago. That work, that ongoing dialogue has never happened as the court commanded the governments of the day to do. And we are now doing that. We are working with the proper rights and title holders according to the Wet'suwet'en people. We will continue to do that. As regards the specific controversy that the member alludes to, we are not treating protesters differently in one part of the province as against another. The fact is, I have been to a meeting with the uh, clan leader of the, of the Gitman Den clan. I have a call today with the CGL leaders. I have met with uh, the elders in the territory as recently as a couple of months ago at the same time meeting with elected uh, leaders as well. We will continue, as the minister said, to find a way to de-escalate this conflict, to try to find a way to do what we should have done a generation ago and finally find a resolution to the land question in the Northwest. Member has supplemental. <laughs> Member. Thank you. Well, this long process that has started uh, some time ago is cold comfort to over 500 people who are under siege, who are trapped, who are worried. I mean, let's, let's be clear here. It's been well documented that equipment has been stolen, equipment has been vandalized, roads, of course, are now blocked, and over 500 workers are being not only under siege, but they're being threatened. People are yelling in their faces, and they're running out of supplies. And what has the government's response been to this situation over the years? This government's response has been to provide the leadership of the protesters $7 million, and to have the current and past ministers standing with these protesters. And there is a difference between how it's treated in the north and how it's treated in the south. 
In his own writing, the Premier was clear to the protesters to leave and listen to the requests of the local nations. Move along was the direction that was given to the protesters at Ferry Creek. But when it comes to the 20 elected bands that have given support for Coastal Lansing, some of them who, some of the members who are behind these picket lines, or these protest lines, I should say, um, the province has taken a very different tact. They've ignored those elected chiefs. So once again, to this government, and perhaps the, uh, the Minister for uh, State for uh, uh, Land and Natural Resource Operations, um, maybe, have, maybe wants to chime in because some of these people are chiefs in his writing. Can they explain why the opinions of the elected chiefs of Northern BC are being ignored? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is absolutely true that we have provided revenue to the Wet'suwet'en leaders in order to achieve unity. The speech that I give to the elected leaders is the same speech that I give to the hereditary chiefs. I did that in late uh, August and September when I was in the territory. I said that we need to find unity amongst Wet'suwet'en if we're ever going to solve this issue. After all, Mr. Speaker, it was the hereditary chiefs who went to the Supreme Court of Canada in the delgamuk Gestaway case. It is they who have the rights and title. The elected chiefs are very much part of the solution. They have pipeline benefit agreements. They have other revenue sharing in the territory. That is true, and we honor that participation. But the truth is we are trying to achieve unity in the way I've described. There's no way that we're treating them differently in the north and the south. It's simply not factual. We are trying to very much to solve this uh, controversy. There is no excuse for vandalism or theft. This is a project that has the permit. It's a, pr a project that has the right to proceed. There is no way, Mr. Speaker, that we condone that in any way, shape, or form. But to suggest that we are somehow ignoring the elected leaders is simply not factually true. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. And, and honestly, it, it's, it's disorienting in the wake of what will probably be one of the most costly storms in terms of infrastructure in BC's history, driven by climate change, that we are in here with two parties, the government and the official opposition, trying to outdo each other about how we're going to get more fossil fuel infrastructure built in this province, fossil fuel infrastructure heavily subsidized by this government. Over the last 36 hours, BC has experienced record-setting weather events complete with mudslides, mass evacuations, which are underway today still, and collapsed infrastructure. Vancouver is cut off from the rest of the country by road right now. We are deeply grateful to staff and leadership of local governments and First Nations across the province who did everything they could to save lives and infrastructures infrastructure and situations that became worse by the hour. The Minister of Public Safety has said that the responsibility for preparedness and emergency response largely falls on local governments. In fact, he said it six times. But this weather affected the entire province, and this provincial government is responsible for provincial highways. The Coquihalla is impassable and might be for months. The Malahat and Highway 7 turned into rivers, there are currently no access in or out of the Lower Mainland. In regional districts, which account for the vast majority of land in BC, roads and highways are under provincial jurisdiction. And when we have climate events that are going to impact huge swaths of the province, the provincial government needs to play a proactive role in emergency preparation and response. Through you, Honourable Speaker, to the Minister of Public Safety, were we hurt? Were, <laughs> we were hurt. Were we hit? by this storm worse than expected, or is our emergency preparation system flawed? Minister of Public Safety. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Honourable Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging that she recognized the, uh, the amazing work done at the local government level uh, and, um, and, and communities uh, in different parts of the province. But I noticed she forgot the, uh, the amazing work done by the members of Emergency Management BC, Honourable Speaker. And I think they need to be acknowledged. And the work done by the contractors and the highway personnel in this province who work day and night during appalling conditions 
the work done by uh, search and rescue uh, volunteers out of, uh, in communities across our province and out of uh, Comox. But I'll also tell the, the member this, is that we recognize that climate change is playing a fundamental role in the challenges that we are facing in the disasters and the emergencies that are facing us. That's why we've undertaken significant work in terms of reforming and overhauling the Emergency Protection Act, being the first province in this country to sign up to the Sendai framework. So it's not just about recovery. It's about prevention, mitigation, response, and recovery, the four key pillars. All of those are part and parcel of the work that's underway to recognize the role that climate change is underway in terms of how we deal with emergencies in this province. And we are going to continue on that work, Honourable Speaker, and I look forward to her support of that incredible legislation when it's tabled in this House. Leader of the Third Party, supplemental. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and we've had a lot of opportunities this year to test how prepared we are for these emergencies. We've had a heat dome, a record-setting wildfire season, a bomb cyclone, a localized tornado, and now severe flooding and infrastructure collapse across the province because of record-setting rainfall. The Alberta government told people to stay home on the weekend in response to this incoming weather system. On Friday, Washington State issued flood warnings and distributed free sandbags in counties forecasted to be heavily impacted. They were proactive and they minimized loss. And yes, I acknowledge absolutely the incredible work of EMBC, of search and rescue, of road crews. And yes, this absolutely is climate change. But the proactive response from this government that we saw to climate change in the last government was to invest $6 billion of taxpayer money into more fossil fuel infrastructure. This past year has been a reckoning, and we need serious, natural, and built infrastructure plans to adapt to the effects of climate change. The plan must be led by the province. It must be proactive. And through you, Honourable Speaker, to the Minister of Public Safety, Solicitor General, having assigned on to the Sendai is something, but what we need is for this government to treat climate change like the emergency that it is and create an action plan that matches the scale Question, of the emergency. Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and I thank the, uh, the member for the question. Uh, and an action plan is exactly what we're doing by overhauling the Emergency Program Act, which is the first time that it's been done since the early 90s when it was put in place. And it means that fundamental principle of the Sendai framework in how you ap approach uh, disaster management, as I said, on the four key, on the four key pillars. That's the fundamental uh, uh, foundation. At the same time, it's recognizing that on the ground, Local emergencies are dealt with by the local governments and the local communities because they know the situation and the problem spots in their communities. <laughs> the coordination that we have seen between the province and local government, I am always amazed at how remarkable it is. I watched this morning as uh, in Abbotsford, the mayor and the council and first responders worked with EMBC to ensure that emergency uh, uh, centers were opened, that evacuation orders were put in place, and that people were evacuated. I've watched it as emergency centers were opened and put in supports in place. It starts at the local level. It works with the province and then goes up to the federal government. This province has been working, this government's been working on a long-term plan that is being implemented, Honorable Speaker. We're gonna continue that work to ensure that we've got the most robust response possible that recognizes that climate change is clearly a driving factor. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Documents obtained under Freedom of Information reveal that the NDP government has made an ideological decision to demolish private child care providers in British Columbia private child care providers in British Columbia. Last fall, the Priorities and Accountabilities Cabinet Committee directed 
the elimination of grants for private providers. And on May 21st, 2021, the Minister of State for Child Care approved a recommendation to, and I quote, discontinue privately owned facility development in the new spaces fund, do not create any additional incentive programs, end quote. So can the Minister of State tell private child care providers and their families why she is actively dismantling these centres that families rely on to get to work? Minister of State for Child Care. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. We know that parents in this province have been struggling to find affordable, high-quality childcare for many, many years, and that is why since 2017, we have started a comprehensive childcare BC plan to support families, to support providers, and also to ensure that early childhood educators are properly compensated and supported throughout this province. And I hope the member opposite has read our childcare plan that we've increased funding significantly, significantly to members. all types of childcare providers, including nonprofit, for profit, government owned, indigenous communities. That Order. is true. Order, members. <laughs> members, come to order. And if the member opposite has not read our child care plan, I can provide a few examples of how we've been supporting for profit child care providers, along with many other providers, through our increased funding to maintain their spaces, through our operating grant, through wage enhancement, and through measures to lower parent fees for those child care providers, including start up funding to create many, many more spaces that are historical throughout this province. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Member for West Vancouver, supplemental. Mr. Speaker, I must say I'm quite confused by that answer. Um, the, members, the, members the minister, listen to the question, please. Perhaps the minister has not read her own decision note. What the minister has just said, what the minister has just said is that there has been lots of investment and will continue to be lots of investment in Please continue. I believe the other side of the House is not listening to what I am saying, or they would not be applauding this, Mr. Speaker. Um, I was just, we just heard the minister say investment in private child care is something that this government is doing, and yet this decision note, this decision note says the opposite. Mr. Speaker, Members. Mr. Speaker, these documents make it clear that this NDP government has made an ideological choice to make it cost prohibitive for child, child, uh, private child care providers to continue operating. We are talking about half of the child care spaces in this province that are largely run, Mr. Speaker, by women entrepreneurs and small independent businesses. The minister's intention, or the minister's decision intended, and I quote from her, uh, from her decision note, Signal government's move away from market-based child care, recognizing it may be cost prohibitive for for-profit providers to remain in the sector, end quote. So why did the minister sign off on a plan to dismantle 60,000 child care spaces that families across the province rely on? Minister of State for Child Care. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and let me set the record straight. During the past four years, and since we started our Child Care BC Plan in 2018, we have supported the fastest space creation in BC's history.
Shall we continue? And if the member Minister. opposite is confused, let me give her the real numbers that we have supported the creation of over 26,000 spaces, which is four, five times more than the member opposite ever created when they were in government for 16 long years. wants access to childcare, so we have been working really hard to find every opportunity possible, and we have learned so much from the past four years of our Childcare BC plan and through the Canada-wide agreement. One thing that we've done with the federal government is to know that we need to focus on creating childcare spaces that could be long-term community assets. But at the same time, Thank while you. we are focused on supporting public nonprofit spaces, our startup grant continues to Mr. support small business owners, family childcare to create more spaces while the other side of the house voted against our plan every step of the way. Member for Camelot South Thompson. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, to, to the, the, the Minister, uh, with all due respect, you don't improve access to childcare by blowing up 60,000 spaces in the private system. And, 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 and thank, thank goodness for, for FOI. That's the only way, that's the only way that we've been able to learn of the Minister's uh, decision to, to, to eliminate 60,000 uh, spaces, uh, child care spaces across British Columbia. And let's be clear, uh, these FOI documents, these FOI documents, this one's, uh, it's called the Ministry of Children and Family Development Decision Note, dated May 21st, 2021. It's signed by the minister Let's responsible the question, for, for, uh, for child care. This, this uh, decision note uh, it clearly shows that the NDP, the NDP uh, made a secret ideological decision to drive independent child care providers who are responsible for almost 50% of all child care spaces in this province to drive them out of business. Mr. Speaker, that's on page two of this uh, decision note. These FOI documents uh, say the NDP's changes for independent child care uh, providers will be, and I quote, making these spaces unavailable in the medium term, end quote. The question to the Minister is this. Why did the Minister make the decision to dismantle 60,000 child care spaces that families across British Columbia count on every single day? Minister of State for Child Care. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. While it is encouraging to hear the member opposite talking about child care, let me remind them they've ignored the child care crisis for 16 long years with lack of investment, hurting our local businesses. The member opposite were the ones who has ignored the child care crisis, left lots of child care providers and early childhood educators struggling with low wages, lack of support, and not being able to maintain their spaces. Ever since we started our Child Care BC plan, we have increased funding for Members. all child care providers, including non-profit, for-profit, indigenous government owned providers, no side to commentary, grant, please. startup funding, funding to maintain their spaces, and we are continuing this work, Honourable Speaker, we're continuing to create child care spaces that will become long-term community assets. We know and we've learned so much since day one of our Child Care BC plan that we're underway to make sure we know that public dollars needs to go into high quality child care spaces that can be long term community assets. And let me give the member opposite an example. Even the member opposite is writing along in Kamloops, the two Kamloops North Thompson and South Thompson writing, we have invested over $40 million in <laughs> Members, order, Camilla South Thompson supplemental. Well, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm holding the document in my hands here, page seven, page seven, 
Page 7, it's signed by the minister responsible for child care. And the recommendation says, and I quote, discontinue for-profit eligibility for the new spaces fund. Do not create any additional incentive programs, end quote. That's on page 7 of the minister's document, Mr. Speaker. This, this document is crystal clear, and I quote, over the last three years, Growth in the childcare sector has been led by for-profit providers, with both the number of for-profit providers and the spaces they deliver outstripping not-for-profit and family providers starting in 2017-2018." And quote. That's on page two of the minister's uh, FOI dis uh, decision note. According uh, to, to this document, independently owned childcare spaces have been steadily increasing since 2003, and page 3 of this uh, FOI decision note says that 83.7 percent of operational spaces created since 2017 are operated by private child care providers. Wow. Private. Wow. That you're gonna private child care down. providers. But astoundingly, uh, astoundingly, members, this very same document you're heckling your own member. recommends blowing up 60,000 private uh, spaces. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this decision is breathtaking in the impact that it's going to have on families across British Columbia. Yes. Why would, why would the minister sign off on a strategy to dismantle 60,000 childcare spaces in communities all over uh, the province of British Columbia? And what does she have to say to all of those families who are going to be devastated by this decision as outlined in her signed decision note? Minister of State for Child Care. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And if the member opposite did not hear me, let me say it again. We have been accelerating the creation of childcare spaces in this province, which is the fastest Members. ever in BC history, which is five more times more than they ever did in 16 long years. We are supporting all child care providers Members. through operating grants, through wage enhancement, to start up funding, and we know that now, because we're going into the fourth year of our child care plan, we need to make sure that we focus on child care spaces that can become long-term community assets that will benefit generations to come. And we're going to continue to support the creation of child care spaces. And I know the member opposite were hackling about the work that we've been doing, but we have invested $2.3 billion into the child care sector, which is historical. Members, spaces let's listen to the that answer, we've please. been supporting and creating the 26,000 spaces we funded. Let me just end with a quote from the member opposite. This is from a quote from the city of Prince George. When they were talking about the child care assessment that happened in 2015, this was someone from Prince George who said at the time there wasn't enough money available during the member's time in government to help create spaces that were required for childcare. But the environment now is very different in 2019 because thankfully now we know there's funding available to help to create spaces and this is from the Prince George Social Planner. The bell and the question period. Honourable members. I have the honor of tabling the Auditor General's report ensuring long distance ground transportation in Northern BC. Madam Clerk. Orders of the day. Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Honorable Speaker. I call second reading Bill 20, Access to Services, uh, COVID 19 Act.
Thank you, members. I'd like to get us underway, and we acknowledge the Minister, Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. I move the bill be now read a second time. In recent weeks, a, a very small group of people has staged disruptive events at schools, hospitals, and other sites that provide essential, where people provide essential services in order to express their views regarding various COVID-19 related matters, uh, such as vaccine and masking requirements. These actions were rightly met with widespread public condemnation, not only because they impeded access to important facilities, but also because of the impact they had on children, school district staff, patients, people in health crisis, and healthcare workers who have been stretched to their limits by the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has created significant strains on critical services we all depend on and have a right to access, like health and education. It has also tested the limits of the people we count on to provide those vital services. Deliberate attempts by individuals to impede, interfere with, or intimidate the people trying to access these services, the children trying to access these services, or the people who provide those services is an affront to the vast majority of British Columbians who have worked so hard to keep each other safe in this time. It's also an insult to the courage of our many frontline workers who have sacrificed so much in service of the public. The proposed Access to Services COVID-19 Act that's before the House today is responsive to these recent events. It seeks to ensure that people who need to use important services can access them and that the people who provide those services to the public can provide those services without being interfered with, disrupted, or made to feel unsafe at a time when their services continue to be under strain due to the pandemic itself. The proposed act would establish access zones around hospitals with emergency rooms, around COVID-19 testing and vaccination sites, and around K-12 schools, both public and independent. It will prohibit specific types of conduct within an access zone, specifically conduct that impedes access to or egress from the facility, conduct that interferes with or disrupts the provision of services at the facility, and conduct that intimidates or attempts to intimidate or otherwise could reasonably cause concern for physical or mental safety. The proposed act will make it an offence to engage in prohibited conduct within the access zone. The proposed act will authorize law enforcement officers to issue fines and violation tickets or, in certain circumstances, to arrest individuals who are contravening the act. It will also provide a statutory basis to apply for an injunction to restrain an individual from contravening the act. The act will establish authority for the Lieutenant Governor and Council, also known as Cabinet, to make regulations to, among other things, prescribe additional facilities or classes of facilities around which access zones are established or to carve out or exclude certain facilities or classes of facilities to, that do not require that level of protection. The Act includes an express provision to clarify that it does not apply in relation to lawful strike, lockout, or picketing within the meaning of the Labour Relations Code. The rights of free expression and peaceful assembly play a fundamental role in our society, but these rights are not absolute. There are other rights, including the right to access essential and vital public services and they can also be limited in order to protect important public values. Further, they should not be exercised in a manner that infringes on the rights of others, including people seeking or providing medical care, school children, and educational staff. This act has been carefully tailored in an attempt to both preserve the rights of free speech and peaceful assembly to the maximum extent possible, while balancing those rights against the vital need to ensure safe access to important public services and to safeguard the people who use and provide them. For example, these prohibitions are not limited to COVID-19 related speech. This ensures two things. First, access to important services is preserved no matter what issue is motivating the behavior that would interfere with access. Second, the legislation does not single out speech that challenges the government's approach to COVID-19. As well, access zones are only being established around those kinds of facilities where disruptive events have occurred to date. This legislation does not apply everywhere. It applies at schools, 
where access zones are only in effect during specific times when children and educational staff are reasonably expected to be present. Further, as noted, the regulations give the flexibility to adjust the size, timing, and location of access zones. So for example, access zones around schools could be turned off, essentially, for the summer months if a facility is not being used. And finally, the Act will only be enforced for a limited period of time as our province continues to respond to and recover from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is set to be repealed on July 1st, 2023, or earlier by regulation. This legislation is not necessary to regulate the conduct of the vast majority of British Columbians. Because most people know that hospitals, schools, and vaccination and testing sites are not the types of places to stage disruptive protests, particularly when these vital public services and the people who provide them have been under such significant strain during the pandemic. Unfortunately, in recent weeks, a small group of people has acted in a way that has disrupted these important services and made vulnerable people and our frontline workers unsafe. We can't let this kind of behavior continue, particularly given the current strain on key services and the people who provide them. It is for these reasons that we are introducing this act today. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Acknowledging the member for Abbotsford West. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I listened with uh, with interest to the uh, the remarks of the Attorney General uh, speaking initially on behalf of the uh, uh, the government. I think it's fair to say that this is one of those uh, bills that uh, elicits a a mixed reaction, and and I will confess uh, a certain measure of of discomfort, um, maybe disappointment that it would uh, uh, be deemed necessary and the attorney has made uh, the case for why the government uh, has concluded uh, that it, uh, it is necessary and I'll, uh, I'll talk about uh, that in a moment. Uh, he has uh, pointed to uh, I think accurately some behavior, societal behavior on the part of a very small number of uh, individuals that has uh, provoked a reaction uh, and criticism on the part of a much larger group of, of our uh, society. And I want to think that um, part of the reason we are uh, only seeing this uh, legislation now some some weeks or months after the, uh, the government indicated that it was uh, preparing it and uh, uh, intended to, uh, to table it is because the government itself has struggled with uh, finding through this legislative instrument uh, the right balance and the attorney has used that uh, word several times in his presentation and I want to talk a little bit about uh, that as well because we are I'm going to suggest confronted by a collision of two tenants of our society. Our, our desire for uh, civility, uh, we seek respectful uh, discourse, we, we seek unity uh, in the pursuit of common purpose, um, which acquires an even more heightened level of importance when we are confronted by a, a, a crisis like the one uh, we have been dealing with, uh, an international uh, pandemic. It is something that I think British Columbians uh, take a, a measure of pride in, the degree to which that unity of purpose has uh, brought people together from all walks of life, uh, all, all activities to confront uh, this challenge that uh, uh, all of us know so well and has had such a profound impact on so many people's lives. So we have, on the one hand, that uh, legitimate, important uh, uh, desire, objective, versus uh, another fundamental tenet, which is the right to disagree. Uh, and to be loud and vocal in that uh, disagreement, uh, to even, dare I say, uh, be unpleasant, to protest against governments, to protest against 
uh, to protest as a single individual if uh, uh, in certain circumstances against measures that may enjoy a broad level of uh, cro bro uh, support from a broad cross-section of society, but that even a single individual may uh, profoundly disagree with. And, and these, are not, uh, uh, these are not merely conventions uh, or traditions or established practices. Um, these are constitutionally guaranteed freedoms secured by the, uh, the bravery and, and blood of previous uh, generations, that, that right to disagree and articulate uh, that disagreement even in the, in the form of organized protest. So what has brought us to this point where we now have a piece of le legislation, uh, Bill 20, that, that asks us and requires us to uh, determine whether or not we are respecting the balance between uh, those freedoms and uh, uh, and the uh, the other tenets of a of a civil society. Well, the the attorney general has uh, referred to them. First and foremost, of course, we are confronted by a public health crisis. Uh, the health minister. Uh, uh, it's well positioned to uh, describe how significantly that has uh, impacted uh, everyone, the delivery of health services. Uh, the attorney on his behalf uh, has uh, referred to the, I think appropriately, the, uh, the measure of appreciation and thanks uh, virtually all British Columbians have for the service rendered uh, by those on the front lines. And we tend to forget today uh, where and when in the aftermath of, of vaccinations and a greater awareness. But in the early days of the pandemic, no one knew. Uh, no one knew what the, uh, uh, what the risks were. And so when we use words like to hero to, to characterize, um, it's really in that context uh, when people stepped up uh, at a time when we didn't have the same amount of information, didn't have the same protections and didn't know. Um, public health agencies have helped to guide uh, our, our society and our population through a myriad of measures, whether it's uh, protective measures um, uh, around, uh, around the use of uh, masks and, and, and other uh, protective uh, devices, the regulation of gatherings, uh, and ultimately the development and dispensation of vaccinations. And, and vaccines. Um, all I would suggest, uh, having been advanced with thought and consideration, I, I think in fairness, uh, one has to acknowledge not always without controversy. Um, not without, uh, at times, differences of opinion about uh, the effectiveness and, uh, and appropriateness of those measures, and, and people have at times expressed those concerns uh, and opposition um, as our uh, laws and freedoms allow them to do, and, and which is their, their right to do. And I suppose the key point here is that but for the actions of a very few, I think we might agree that this legislation wouldn't be necessary. But there has been the actions of a few uh, that have crossed the threshold of what uh, most reasonable thinking uh, people in this province would deem acceptable. The images of uh, people storming into a school, however passionate, uh, however genuinely held those beliefs might be strike most reasonable people in this province as having crossed the line. And representing uh, conduct uh, that uh, not only perverts the intention of those constitutionally guaranteed uh, rights to discourse and protest and expression, but also puts others at risk. And 
and causes them not just inconvenience, uh, but perhaps even danger and trauma. And is therefore in the minds of, I think, most uh, British Columbians uh, unacceptable. Similarly, that a few would choose to descend upon uh, a hospital, a healthcare facility, and uh, assault, for to spit on someone is a form of assault. Uh, the very people who have uh, been at the forefront, forefront of trying to protect members of society, uh, as I mentioned a few moments ago, uh, and at times when it was far from certain that the protective measures that had been put in place would be sufficient to protect them. I think strikes most British Columbians as being not just disrespectful, uh, but conduct uh, that must be prevented and for which there must be sanctioned. We, we saw, Mr. Speaker, I think a very small group of people who in exercising their freedom to choose, sadly sought to prevent others from exercising their freedom to choose. And did so in a way uh, that most, uh, again, most reasonable members of our society would deem inappropriate. And I, I feel obliged, although I suspect it was not uh, the reason the government opted to uh, develop this legislation for uh, it, it seems clear that it was in the works uh, some time ago and, and uh, much longer ago than, uh, than last week. Uh, but I think British Columbians were profoundly dismayed when uh, just last week on uh, on Thursday, on a, on a day when we as a province and a nation choose to uh, commemorate uh, those who made the ultimate sacrifice to achieve for our society the collective uh, right uh, to uh, the freedom to choose, the freedom to debate, the freedom to disagree, the freedom to protest, that again, a very small group of people would choose that moment and that place uh, to interrupt and disrupt and disrespect that commemoration. And irony doesn't seem to be a sufficiently strong word, but I must confess, I thought to myself, The irony that people who I don't doubt uh, feel passionately about protecting their right to choose would decide to attack and disrespect, attack is too strong a word, but to disrespect and disrupt the commemoration of the very people who made that sacrifice to preserve for them that right to choose. And uh, I, I think, I will say sadly, I think those people uh, did themselves a disservice, uh, did all of us uh, a disservice. So to address the behavior that the attorney has uh, referred to, the misbehavior, the bad behavior that he has uh, observed and that I have uh, commented upon and, uh, and acknowledged, uh, the government says it requires uh, an additional tool. And the attorney uh, moments ago uh, has made his initial case for um, uh, an argument for saying that uh, he believes the government has uh, struck an appropriate uh, balance in developing that tool to, to respect uh, those freedoms. And, and I would say, uh, importantly, 
uh, Mr. Speaker. The attorney says, and, and the legislation, the bill before us, uh, makes clear that the tool will exist only until July 21st, uh, July 1st, uh, 2023. And, and there's uh, uh, further, the bill, and I'll confirm this with the attorney in committee stage, makes, as far as I can see, no provision for extending uh, that date uh, through any regulatory means. Uh, if, if the tool that is purported to be created by this legislation is to extend beyond July 1st, 2023, uh, it will require a renewed consideration by this chamber and the people who sit in this assembly at that time. I, I will say um, that is uh, for me, and I think uh, many members of this chamber, certainly on this side of the house, a fundamentally important, uh, uh, fundamentally important dimension to the, uh, the legislation uh, before us. Uh, and not the only reason, but a big part of the reason uh, that uh, I am able to say that uh, in the official opposition, we are prepared to offer uh, support for the, uh, the creation of the tool on a limited time, uh, limited time basis. Now we're going to pose some questions to the attorney uh, because uh, in, in the committee stage, uh, and we're going to test the proposition uh, that he has made about it representing a, uh, an appropriate balance uh, of the considerations that uh, I have uh, spoken of. There are some pretty broad regulatory powers uh, contained within the, uh, within the bill, not to extend uh, the life of the, the life of the law, which is significant, but to extend its application to other uh, uh, to other facilities. Um, it, there's an interesting, let's say, inconsistency at this stage. Um, I'll pass judgment on on the use of that word after uh, the committee stage debate. But uh, on the one hand, it is a bill. Uh, whose need has been uh, has arisen in the context of the uh, uh, of a health crisis, the, the pandemic, and yet the attorney uh, just a few moments ago uh, made it uh, clear that uh, it can be applied uh, if the government so chooses uh, to other uh, to protests relating to other matters. Well, the House will be interested, I expect, to to know uh, what may be in the attorney's and the and the government's mind, uh, uh, even for. The, the year and a half that the, the, the bill will be uh, uh, available for use uh, to what the circumstances are in which the, uh, the government might choose uh, to uh, draw on the, uh, the use of, uh, of this new tool. We'll uh, want to ask the attorney about the use of existing tools uh, because the essence of the argument uh, uh, that uh, is sp spoken uh, or not is that the government requires this tool because existing tools uh, were not sufficient to address the, the bad behavior uh, that uh, has been uh, described and commented upon. I want to pose some questions about uh, that of the attorney uh, as well, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and to what extent those existing tools, uh, wh whether they be trespass uh, or other forms of, uh, of sanction and criminal sanction, were deemed uh, uh, inappropriate or uh, unworkable. The, uh, the legislation allows for the, uh, uh, allows actually for certain prohibited activities because the, the legislation purports to create an access zone and then preclude certain prohibitive activities. The legislation actually permits certain prohibited activities in an access zone in certain circumstances and it will be uh, uh, interesting and uh, I think appropriate to hear from the attorney uh, about the circumstances in which he and the government believe um, prohibited activities like intimidation um, are ever appropriate uh, in, uh, in close proximity to a, a school or a hospital or another facility. So uh, I'm sure someone in the, uh, the attorney's uh, uh, realm will uh, we'll be tracking some of my comments with respect to the nature of the questions uh, he can expect to uh, receive as the bill moves into uh, 
uh, committee stage. Um, I, uh, finally, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I will say this. If there, if there is, as I expect there is, uh, general support in this assembly for the creation of an additional temporary tool, then uh, I will only say that I am hopeful and I suspect I am correct in saying that there is an equally shared sentiment and that is the hope that over the course of the next year and a half it will not be necessary to use that tool. Thank you, Member. Recognizing the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and, and I rise to speak to Bill 20, the Access to Services COVID-19 Act. And uh, I'll, I'll begin by echoing the comments of the member of the official opposition um, that these uh, disruptive behaviors of people uh, were deeply distressing uh, when we saw um, people choosing to block entrances to hospitals, healthcare centers, schools, as a way to express their desires to have, as, as he pointed out, the right for choice and, and the implications of the choices being taken away from people, um, both working and trying to access these places, were, were serious. Uh, I think we are completely united in here that uh, that is not an appropriate way to express disagreement with any kind of government initiative. There are many, many appropriate ways to express disagreement, including uh, demonstrations as we've had on the lawn of the legislature, uh, corresponding with your elected officials, uh, expressing yourself publicly on social media. There are many, many avenues uh, to express disagreement, but it is a line that is crossed when people cannot access health care or health care workers are being harassed or children are being harassed going to school, teachers and, and staff being harassed. I would boldly speak on behalf of my entire caucus and uh, express our, our agreement that uh, these are not actions that we want to see. Other provinces also reacted and responded with legislation uh, to ensure that people would not be impeded uh, while accessing government services in this type. And I, point to Bill 105 out of Quebec as an example. It's a one-page bill, uh, and it identifies no, no, one may be, no one may be less than 50 meters from the grounds of the following places in order to demonstrate in any matter in connection with health measures ordered under Section 123 of the Public Health Act, COVID vaccinations, or any other recommendation issued by public health authorities. And then it identifies the places where these kinds of demonstrations would not be allowed. Our bill is a little bit different than what Quebec uh, put out. It does speak to how a person must not, in an access zone for a facility, impede access or egress, physically interfere with or otherwise disrupt the provision of services at the facility, or intimidate or attempt to intimidate an individual or otherwise do or say anything that could be reasonably be expected to cause an individual concern for the individual's physical or mental safety. But what's different in the Quebec Act from our Act is the specific reference in the Quebec Act to COVID-19. In, in the Act that this government has brought forward, facility is defined as a site at which a service is provided. And so that doesn't limit it necessarily to healthcare sites or education sites. 
And what the Quebec bill does, again, that's different uh, in its one page, um, is it doesn't extend any kind of regulatory powers to government to make other rules around demonstrations. And as the minister pointed out in his opening notes, this bill in Clause 6 does indeed provide the government, the Lieutenant Governor in Council, to make regulations, to prescribe additional facilities and additional classes of facilities, and to add those not in the legislation here that we are going to be debating, but yet again, and this is a trend with this government, to add them so that they can be added by regulation. And it's this part of the bill that raises concerns for us. And it raises concerns because yet again, it, it, it's an example of this government providing itself <laughs> with additional powers by regulation outside of what is debated in this legislature to extend this quite a bit beyond what I think the public was expecting with legislation like this. The public was expecting to see the disruptive events at hospitals and schools stopped. What the public I don't think was expecting was to see regulatory powers put into this legislation that gives the government the ability to extend this kind of enforcement to matters that don't concern COVID-19 at all. And so to have it on the title of the bill in parentheses, Access to Services COVID-19 Act, doesn't really tell the whole story. And it's this that, that raises concerns uh, for us and our own level of discomfort um, around this legislation. Because yet again, we are being asked to debate and pass legislation that provides government with the ability to make more regulations without seeking the approval of this chamber. This is a pattern that's becoming very familiar. We see it with the bill that was passed last December around sick pay, and we're going to see what decision the government will come up with because it gave itself the ability in regulation to determine how many paid sick leave days people in British Columbia can expect. And so I, we will be asking questions in committee stage uh, for certain around why, unlike, for example, Quebec, with their one-page bill with legislation very specific to COVID-19, very specific to the locations where it applies, and a 30-day expiry of the legislation. Now, they did just recently extend it for another 30 days uh, to November 21st, and we shall see if they extend it again. But that is a constrained and, in my view, appropriate response to an issue that all of us agree needed a response from government. But what we weren't expecting, and I, I truly don't think the public was expecting this, was the capacity for some pretty broad, sweeping ideas about what kind of facilities uh, and what kind of classes of facilities that this could apply to, what kind of activity or class of activity. And uh, I 
I worry about that. The, the member of the official opposition, Abbotsford West. West, talked about unity and common purpose. And I couldn't agree more that this is what we should be striving for over and over again. Always bringing it back to, as a society, how do we, how do we create more unity, more common purpose, in particular, in the face of what we are going to experience more and more often, which are disruptions to our society, disruptions to our communities, whether they're in the form of, as we've seen for almost two years now, a global pandemic, or whether they're in the form as, as we saw over this weekend and, and into today, extreme weather events precipitated by the growing impacts of climate change. I think about the imperative of creating unity and common purpose all the time because we need each other more and more in the face of growing emergencies. We need to be able to understand the importance and value of collective response to these forces that are so much bigger than us and that are going to impact us so heavily. But I don't think unity and common purpose is achieved necessarily by saying, here's what you can't do, here's what's not allowed. Sometimes we have to do that, but that should be in the rarest of occasions. I think unity and common purpose, in terms of role of government, is achieved through transparency, accountability, and incredibly importantly, it's achieved through ensuring that the public understands what informs decision making. What are we trying to achieve with our decisions? What data and evidence are we using to inform these decisions? How are we gonna measure success of those decisions? How are we going to communicate effectively about those decisions? Common purpose helps create unity. And when we have government giving itself the regulatory power to make big decisions and not being transparent about those decision-making processes, we erode that unity and common purpose. And so I hope that there will be some reflection on the inclusion of, these, of this Clause 6 and the regulation-making authority, and a recognition that we could indeed follow the much more prescribed and concise model that we see from Quebec and work on building that unity and common purpose through the actions every day in here and recognizing the heavy and burdensome responsibility that government has in all of its work to do that. Thank you. Thank you, member. Uh, recognizing the member for Surrey Cloverdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, today I rise in support of uh, Bill 20, Access to Services uh, Act. I've started coining a, a phrase, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I think it goes a long way with other people. Um, we're living in a trying time. Uh, you know, we hear about it that it's, it's been 100 years and, and we're, we're back at it again. And what this bill doesn't do, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, it doesn't stop a person or a group uh, from actually protesting if they do it peacefully. And why this bill is important, because it still protects the rights of all British Columbians to their democratic right to protest, again, peacefully. But what this bill does do is it creates those protected zones uh, around to key services like our hospitals, our schools, our COVID testing sites, 
and our vaccination clinics. You know, it wasn't that long ago that the hospitals, that we saw a parade of police cars, ambulances, fire trucks, people going around them, honking their horns. And they were cheering all of those frontline workers on, on a daily basis at seven o'clock. And in fact, as those parades grew, it was the hospital workers that were worried about how this could affect uh, the patients that were coming in. Now, months later, we are creating a safe zone to protect these very workers at a time when we used to bang pots and pans. Now we see protests where frontline workers are, not, are not, no longer treated like heroes, but they're attacked for doing their jobs. Our schools used to be called safe places until we saw demonstrators enter into the schools and intimidate the staff and children. These zones that we're creating are going to provide further protection to the staff and the children at these schools. These behaviors have jeopardized access to important services that are already under extraordinary strain due to COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, two weeks ago, my grandson was born at BC Children's Hospital. Lennon came into the world two months early, and I can't imagine what the added stress to mom would have been if access to that hospital was restricted. Mr. Speaker, to protest in a way that intimidates and humiliates those who are working and delivering the vaccine is unacceptable. To protest in a way that intimidates and humiliates those workers who are operating the COVID-19 testing sites is equally unacceptable. These workers are the main reason, and I think the Minister of Health may want to correct me on this if I'm wrong, but this is the main reason that we're nearing 87% of all people over the age of 12 have received their second dose. These are trying times. And it should be noted that the vast majority of British Columbians are acting in a reasonable manner. And it's the acts of a few that bring this legislation forward. Bill 20 will help maintain access to these critical services that all people in BC rely on. It will protect those who provide those services from this type of disruptive behavior. I agree with the member from Abbotsford West that someday, someday, we won't need to use this legislation. Mr. Speaker, I'm waiting for the day when that day comes and we go back to that banging of pots to celebrate the frontline workers. I can't wait for that day that we don't have to worry about do we have access to a hospital. I can't wait for that day for when my grand grandson goes to school and he can walk there safely and attend school without, without um, any repercussions. Mr. Speaker, I stand here to support Bill 20 in all of its manner. Noting the, noting the hour, member. Oh, noting the uh, hour, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I adjourn. What do the we debate. Do? Yeah, the debate. Okay. Members, you heard the motion. All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Government House Leader. House Members, you heard the motion again. All those in favor indicate aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. This House stand adjourned until 1.30 this afternoon.